Hello, and welcome to Glory Be. Interesting people and how they pray. Each week, we chat with interesting people about their lives, their work, and how they pray. I'm Sharon Hanish. And I'm Father Vince Fernandez, and we're joined by our producer, Mike Malcolm. Today's guest is Sister Teresa Alethea Noble. She is a daughter of St. Paul. She's founder of the Memento Mori Project and the author of uh, The Prodigal You Love, uh, inviting loved ones back to the church. She's also a contributor to Word on Fire blog. Uh, She lives now in Boston and serves at the Pauline Publishing House in the editorial department. She's also the daughter of Chris and Jane Noble, who are parishioners here uh, at St. Mary's and also a Tulsa native. Uh, Sister Teresa, good to have you here. Thanks for so much for having me on. No, it's awesome. Um, how are you doing during uh, this year, 2020, and all the craziness going on? Oh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's been an easy year for anyone, nuns included. People right. assume that, that we're just over here just praying and happy all the time, but we're having a difficult time, too. Um, and we've, we haven't been leaving the house hardly at all because in the I live in the mother house, so half of our community is our retired sisters as much as our sisters retire, but our older sisters. So we've been really kind of trying to protect them as much as possible and social distance and be super careful. So it's been an interesting year for everybody. So do you live in, you're you're, uh, a daughter of St. Paul. If you could talk to us sort of about what that is, do you live, when you mentioned, do you live, do you live in a convent or a monastery or... Um, I know your ne- the nickname I've always heard are, that you're the media nuns. So, if you could talk okay. about what is a daughter of Saint Paul? Yeah, so uh, we were founded in Italy, but our mother house in the U.S., which is a convent, but it's like our main convent in the U.S. is in Boston, and there's about eighty sisters there. So, ha- um, half of our community is our older sisters, and half is the community that runs our publishing house. And then all of our other sisters around the country uh, run bookstores. So our convents are always connected to bookstores. So that's, yeah. And the Daughters of St. Paul were founded by Blessed James Alberione. And he, he kind of had this prophetic vision of the future um, and the need for religious, consecrated religious to dedicate themselves to using modern media to spread the gospel. So at the time of of our founding, that was publishing, which we still do. But um, he really tasked us to use like the most modern and efficacious means of media. So if he were alive today, um, he would definitely be wanting us to be online, to be using absolutely every tool possible to reach the most number of people. That's um, something unique about our charism. Yeah, and you guys are, I mean, you're all over Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, I see you guys' stuff all the time. Um, and you're really big. I think something that made you, like, Catholic Twitter famous was uh, your whole Memento Mori project, right? And just um, how big that is. I see it kind of all the time, especially around, yeah, during All Souls this month in November. Um, I see a lot of kind of posts on people, you know, showing their, their skulls on their desks and, you know, having Mentor Mori written. Could you kind of speak about that? Like, where did that come from? How did that kind of begin? How did it get so kind of popular? Yeah, that, that began uh, three years ago. And it was really inspired by our founder, Blessed James Alberione, who kept a skull on his desk. So um, in Italy, they still have his desk preserved and his skull is sitting there in the corner. And I remember finding out about that when I joined the convent and I thought, that's really punk rock. I'm going to do that sometime. I just thought it was cool. I didn't really understand what it was or why he did it. Um, and then I... I I was in the convent for about seven years before I, it, the Holy Spirit kind of brought it back to my mind, and I thought, I'm going to do that. So at the time that I did it, I just thought, don't know how to meditate on death, don't totally know what this is about, but I'm going to tweet about it on Twitter because that will get me in the habit if I just do this every day for like two weeks or something. But when I started to do it, a lot of people started asking me questions about like, what, what is meditation on death? What's the history of it in the church? And what does memento mori mean? And so I started to do a lot more research. And I, I started to realize that the, the roots of this practice go all the way back to the beginning of salvation history. And all throughout scripture, I started to hear it 
And every single um, time I went to Mass, I would hear something that was like a reminder in Scripture to think about our mortality and to prepare for heaven. So as, as I started to learn more about this practice, other people were really interested. It was just oh, oh, like spread like wildfire. And at, at this point, it's just all throughout. People are talking about memento mori a lot more in Catholic culture, which is really cool because I think, um, I think our founder is up in heaven super happy about it because he, told, he noticed in the 50s, actually, that meditating on death and all of the last things – um, heaven, hell, and purgatory were uh, and judgment were really kind of waning. Like people were not really thinking about those things. And he said to our sisters, never let this kind of fall away from your spiritual practice. Always meditate on your death and all of the last things. It's very important to your spiritual life. And he said, and help other people to do the same. And I didn't read that quote until I kind of started this. So it, it was really, I think it was a, a inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of the other sisters was translating Italian and brought it to me and said, did you know that he said this? And I, and I thought, oh, you know, I didn't, but I'm not surprised because I, I felt very inspired by him the whole time while this was happening. So, you know, um, my daughter had gone on a cruise and anyway, she brought back this skull and I thought, what is, why is she having, bring me a skull? <laughs> and then when I started follow you, following you on Twitter, I pulled out my skull. I felt kind of, you know, super cool because I had a skull to put in my office. You know, I loved your reflections on that. Tell, tell me about, you have a, a journal now and you've written a book. Um, is that yeah. something, is, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, so af after this started, and, and I could really feel like that this was something inspired by the Holy Spirit and asking God, you know, I what what should I do with this? Our sisters run a publishing house, and, and I had already published, uh, our sisters had already asked me to write a book um, in Novitiate. So I started to think, how can I give people resources to help them to meditate on death? Because I, now that it's been, been about three years that I've been meditating on death every day, I think one of my fears is that I started a trend for some people, but they're not actually meditating on death. And it, the practice is so important, and it's really important to have it be a regular practice. So um, like St. Benedict has in his rule to keep death daily before your eyes for his monks. So I think regularity in practice, in the practice of meditation on death is, is really important. And I think people get intimidated by it. Like, like, oh, you know, one of my sisters is telling me, I thought maybe it meant that I had to just sit in front of a skull for a half an hour every day and just be morbidly thinking about death. And it really doesn't take that long. It's something that you can do in your in your daily examination or review of your day. It can take a few seconds, but you just kind of remind yourself, but do it in the context of prayer and ask the Lord for everything that it brings up, you know, to help help you to deal with it. Um, but the regularity and the continuity of it is really something that can change people's spiritual lives. So, um, so that's why I decided to, to get to write some resources that would help people to integrate it into their spiritual lives. So, there's a journal and um, a, a Lenten devotional that can be used any Lent, and it has reflections for each day of Lent, and then a prayer book on all of the last things. That's wow. awesome. The the uh, emo kid in me rejoices at this. <laughs> yeah, uh, you would it's like just it. So, it's then. so cool. Yeah, it's like I'm back in eighth grade again, you know, like wearing all black and yeah, right. have my hair over one of my eyes. But I think it's, I mean, it's such a needed thing and you're right. Like death in modern culture is, we kind of like push it aside, right? Like we don't even want to think about it. Like I've done a lot of funerals and it's very like sanitized, right? Like we don't even call mm -hmm. it like a, a death anymore. We call it like a celebration of life kind of thing, which is, I mean, like good. But um, mm -hmm, but it's like mm -hmm. the reality, right? Like we're going to die mm -hmm. one day and we're going to face judgment. And this isn't like, you know, some kind of scared straight program. This is to, this is just like what right. happens. And it's so good right. for our spiritual lives. Um, you mentioned kind of posting it on Twitter. Um, Sharon's on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. And uh, I've recently learned there's like a subculture called like Catholic Twitter where, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of its own kind of thing. Um, and I guess my question for you, since you, you know, sisters are, or online, all the stuff, you know, and, and have a good presence there. 
at least for me, I, you know, the internet can be a great resource, but also like soul sucking, like a difficult <laughs> place to be, especially mm-hmm. Twitter. Um, you know, there's sometimes where we're like, wow, this is putting me in a bad spot mentally. I need to like take a break or whatever. How do you guys kind of find a balance with um, having that social media presence and not letting it consume your soul or, you know, kind of put you in a bad spot spiritually? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's that's the difficulty of our charism is we're called to kind of be in the middle of media and um, different forms of media can be addictive and it can be soul sucking, as you say. And and there's just a lot of darkness online. Um, but our our charism really is is to bring some some of the light of the gospel online. And I think um I think that's the call of all all Christians online. And uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes we're part of the darkness in what we what we share with others or how we argue with others or how we talk to others. And I'm including myself. There have been a lot of times where I've had to examine the way that I reacted to someone online um, and either apologize to them or just apologize to Jesus in confession because there are, I, I think sometimes we can think of the online world as less real um, because it's virtual, but there are real people on the other side of it and we can injure them and sin online just as easily as, as easily as we can in person. So, um, so I think regular examinations of conscience are important. And then I take breaks. So I'll take breaks, like maybe during Lent or during Advent, or if I just feel like I'm overwhelmed and it's getting, starting to get to me or trolls are just driving me nuts. I'll just take a week's break or something like that. I think it's really important to kind of detach from social media when we feel like it's, it's kind of overwhelming our, our emotions or our life or we're spending too much time or we get those reports at the end of the week that you've been on, on your phone for this many hours. And (laughs) I I think about that, like at the end of my life, I'm going to get a report on my phone. Like you've spent this many years on your phone. (laughs) It's it's kind of depressing. So yeah, I put things in perspective sometimes to just take a break. I have to say though, when I scroll through and yours come up, it's a it's a light in the darkness uh, in many 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 occasions. So I'm grateful for what what you do yeah. and for the charism of your order and for the mindfulness of doing that. Um, do you have any um, kind of tips in terms of like engaging other people that like disagree with you and you know because like one of my possibly sinful pastimes is just like I see a, a post on Facebook and there's like a hundred comments. And I'll make some popcorn and just like click view all comments <laughs> and just like read and be like, oh, this is super entertaining. I don't know if I got to, I got to figure that out. I got to discern if that's actually the sin or not. But, um, <laughs> but obviously those discussions are, they go nowhere for the most part, right? Like you're just people, it seems like it's just people yelling at each other online. Do you have any, so I'm sure when you post stuff, people will disagree or, you know, respond angrily. How do you like respond to that? You know, I've learned a lot over the years, and I I do think that um, our charism gives us a special grace to deal with it, because to be honest, if I weren't a sister, I don't think I would be spending much time on social media, and uh, at least I would be spending less time on it, and I think it would impact me more deeply, but I, I do feel like God protects us to some degree, because that's part of our charism, just to be online, but um what was your question again? I think well, I lost so the I get yeah. How do you um you know someone responds to you in a negative way or in an angry way, oh, and, and so how yeah. do you do you engage? Do you just kind of let it go, or do you? Um, it really depends. I pray to the Holy Spirit because honestly, sometimes I'm like this person is such a troll, and then I'll pray and I'll feel like oh well, I'm going to respond to them, and then they'll apologize to me, or they'll the, I'll actually have a conversation with them. And sometimes I definitely make a bad judgment on that. But um, but yeah, I de- I, when I pray to the Holy Spirit, I feel like he helps me to determine who I'm going to respond to or not. And not to just assume that someone it means to come across the way they came across. You know, that's a great um, prayer is so important, you know, in our everyday, even with social media. That's just uh, a, a great piece of advice. And our, our podcast is called Glory Be Interesting People and How They Pray. And so it's perfect timing to sort of segue into 
talking with you about how you actually pray. Um, so you're a daughter of St. Paul. Like, do you all um, pray in community? Um, is St. Paul, <laughs> I mean, you're a daughter of St. Paul. I was wondering, like, does St. Paul influence your prayer life? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the reasons I joined the convent is because I do love to pray, and it was really helpful to have prayer just kind of integrated into my life, um, kind of by default, by the way that we live our life. So our, our day starts with a half an hour of meditation on the gospel, followed by morning prayer all together in the chapel, and then we have Mass, and then we have an hour of adoration during the day that we can just choose whenever we want to do that, and then a half an hour of prayer, which that half an hour was added by our founder when one of the sisters came to him and said, um, "My, they called him maestro, like teacher. We, um, we just have so much to do. We're trying to run the printing presses. We have so much going on, and I don't... They said, I don't think we can pray our hour of adoration. And he said, oh, you don't think you can pray your hour of adoration? You need to add a half an hour of prayer. (laughs) So, um, and then we have evening prayer together. But uh, one thing that's helpful for for me is the Pauline way of structuring the hour of adoration. And so the way that we do that is it's way, truth, life, because we have a, a, um, a devotion to Jesus as way, truth, life. So the beginning of the hour of adoration is truth, which we read a passage of scripture and then we meditate on it. And then the second part is way, which we make an examination of conscience during that time. And then we end with life, which is um, intercessory prayer. So we can pray the, the rosary or, or we can just spend that time interceding for the needs of the world. And so that's helpful in, in, in structure, because in times of dryness, I can always return to that structure and kind of, okay, this is where I am. This is the part that I'm in, and can t- it's like a helpful. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. I saw Father Vince over here scratching away. He's yeah, gonna, I have a. Uh, I got a. Yeah, you're gonna hear in the homily here pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also have a, I have a silent retreat that I'm leading a bunch of people on, and uh, the last time when I led, people were like, "Whole hour is really hard. I can't do it." And I was like, "Okay, I gotta." How do I like break this down yeah. in an easier way? And that's that's an awesome way to to do it. Um, way truth life, and it's easy to remember. And um, like you said, when it's when prayer is hard, it's it's good to have some kind of structure to kind of fall back on. Yes. And, and, you know, yeah. Another question I had when you were talking um, about sort of entering the convent, your journey. I also know because we've talked before because we read your book. Um, the prodigal you love inviting loved ones back to the church, but it was about your your own personal journey. Um, Can you talk a little bit about uh, that? You know, was there a transformative moment? Um, So you were an atheist. And if you want to just chat about that a little bit. Yeah, I I became an atheist when I was 14. So my parents obviously raised me Catholic. Um, I know some parishioners probably know my parents. Um, and I went with my family to St. Mary's, so maybe they recognized me in my teenage years, my grumpy face <laughs> being dragged to Mass. Um, and I, I had a conversion in my 20s where I, I was in Costa Rica, and I had been, a lot of things led up to the conversion, but um, God had just been kind of leading me away from atheism to really be open to the possibility that there are spiritual realities in the world. But I did have a moment of conversion when I was in Costa Rica where I was walking over, I was walking to the farm that I was volunteering on. It was early in the morning and I looked at the mountains around me and I, and I felt like this gratitude for it. And at the same time, it was like an intellectual movement where I recognized that, it was that all of this beauty around me was created by something beautiful and eternally beautiful. And so I knew that God existed in that moment and I knew that he loved me and that he had a plan for my life. So that totally, totally transformed like the way that I viewed my life. And then that ultimately led me to return to the Catholic church and then uh, join the convent, which is very unexpected for me and for my family. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you know, how did you know about the daughters? I mean, had you looked at other convents or did you, were you familiar? Yeah, 
I did. I, you know, I felt God leading me to discern religious life. And I very reluctantly was like, I don't know, this is not something I'm interested in, but I'll look around. And I was very grumpy about it. And, um, but I, I went to a, a lot of different orders and visited them and none of them really felt like a good fit. And I remember kind of going to prayer and, and saying to Jesus, you know, this was your idea in the first place. And I'm not even that excited about it. Could you please just <laughs> lead me to the right place? And um, so I found, you know, appropriately, I found the daughters on online through through YouTube. And then I went and visited them. And when I when I went and visited them, it, like I remember I was at a meal and I immediately felt almost like I was with family. I had this moment of deja vu or something. And it made, it made me just feel like, like this is where I belong and this is where. So that was the beginning of looking more into the daughters. Yeah. That's awesome. And I will say, I mean, the daughters of St. Paul, your, your guys' bookstore when I was in seminary was like clutch. It had all the books I could ever where want. Were, were you in Chicago? No, I was in at North American College. It was one in Rome. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. 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 And it, I was just like, this is, and it had like a gazillion languages. I was like, I, I felt like I was a Toys R Us again, honestly. Um, I guess, you know, it sounds like the daughters have, you have a lot of time in prayer, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a point in your life um, when it was really hard to pray? Um, you know, as a religious sister, I could see, you know, having an hour and a half of prayer every day could, could get monotonous or, or difficult, right? So, you know, was there any time specifically as this or is it just kind of a, uh, you know, ups and downs of prayer life or. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's definitely t been times of dryness in prayer and times where it's been kind of excruciating to just to sit through an hour where I just feel like I need to go do something else or I feel so fidgety or I'm thinking about so many different things. But, um, or I'm, there's periods of time where I just sleep through my whole hour. <laughs> I'm so tired. I wake up and I'm like, wow, that was an hour long nap. <laughs> but actually something that comforts me about that is Therese used to fall asleep in her prayer. And she used to say that that's like kind of going under for surgery and Jesus is the divine physician and he works on you. And so even in times where I feel like nothing is happening, I, it's always a good reminder for me just that God, God is God is doing something. And in fact, he may be doing more when I'm not feeling consoled or when I'm not feeling like this is the best time of prayer ever. Um, even if it's just through exor me exercising my faith by just sitting through a bad time of prayer. So I think it kind of helps me to grow in trust of him and to really give it back to him and say, you know, this is all about you and you're in charge and you are the powerful one. And I know that you can make me holy, even if I'm having very bad times of prayer. Right. Yeah. And I, I, that's always, that's hard to remember, but it's, it's so true. Like, even though prayer is hard, the Lord is working, right? It's not like, you know, just because we're not like feeling it or, or consoled by it. Um, you're right. Like the Lord could be working even more in those moments, right? In those periods of dryness or difficulty, um, even when it's excruciating. That was very consoling. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I love oh, hearing that. <laughs> yeah. um, finally, the, the last question that we like to ask all our guests is, if you could tell everyone in the world to pray for something, what would that be and why? Um. I think for the salvation of all people, just because that's the most important thing is to pray for the salvation of as many people as possible, especially the people who are close to us and our loved ones who either are away from the church or don't believe. Um, so I, I think there is a special efficacy in our prayers for the people who are closest to us. Um, God hears those. He hears our pleas. So I would I would suggest that. Excellent. And Mike will link in the show notes to uh, your book and some articles from Word on Fire, because the book really, for people who do have children that are away from the church or, you know, family members, it, it was excellent. I just loved it. And um, so prayers for our loved ones and all those to return to the church. I, salvation, the salvation of their souls. I love that. Thank you so much. 
So, um, we always ask our guests to lead us in a glory be to close out our podcast. Okay. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Glory Be is a production of the Office of Communications at the Church of St. Mary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm your producer, Mike Malcolm. See you next time.